And I can completely understand, you know, why Iowans might like to keep Iowa what it is. But then they also have to realize that these people who want to come to Iowa from El Salvador and from Guatemala, they're coming there because we have left them no choice. They yeah, are right. coming to Iowa and to Illinois and to New York because Americans have gone into these countries and ruined their countries for decades now. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. Well, as long as humans have been on the planet, they've been doing a few things consistently. I mean, there's things they do at different periods in history, but there's a few things they have always done. Eat, have sex, do some kind of worship of a god, and migrate, move around. I mean, we know from the fossil record and that humans started in one very specific place in this world, and after enough time, they got everywhere. And the way they got everywhere was moving around, migrating. In fact, for a long period of time, I think about 200,000 years before we get what we call kind of civilization and, and we settle down, moving around is what humans do to survive. We are hunters and gatherers, and what hunters and gatherers do by definition is not stay in one place. They move around foraging for food, following animals that they can hunt and kill to eat. And so movement, humans moving from place to place, is as deeply embedded in us as a species as almost anything that we do. And it's wild to consider the fact that this continues on into early human history throughout civilization. I mean, human travel or going from one place to another, even way back during periods of time in which it was inordinately difficult to do so, is still a central human experience. And you go back and you look at the Bible and you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, right? What, what is the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? Ultimately, the reason that God brings his wrath down on Sodom and Gomorrah is because he sends in a few angels as strangers, as immigrants into the town, and they beat up and assault those immigrants. That's the test of virtue for this town, God's test for virtue, sending in strangers. Read the writings of the Roman era, and it is just wild to imagine how much movement and migration and mixing of cultures there are. 2,000 years ago, there's no airplanes, there's no fossil fuels, it's not easy to get from place to place, but people move around. Jesus is born in Bethlehem because people move around. It is one of the fundamental constants of human life on the planet. And I say that because right now, that fundamental constant is supercharged by a bunch of things that are happening in our world. The lingering effects of colonialism, the distance between the developed world and the developing world in terms of access to things like healthcare, jobs, money, and affluence, combined with the ease of travel, right? We can now fly around. We can take uh, vehicles that have fossil fuels. It is easier to get from point A to point B than it has ever been in human history. And the inequalities between humans are probably as great as they've ever been in history. And so you combine those together and put atop that the fact that we are on the front edge of a climate crisis, which is going to chase hundreds of millions of people from the places they live. We're in the midst of and entering the greatest period of human migration that will ever have happened on the planet. That's what's happening right now. And it is disrupting a lot of our politics. You see virulent, reactionary, in some cases, essentially proto-fascist movements against immigrants popping up all over the developed world, and not just in the developed world. I mean, <laughs> there are riots against refugees in places in the developing world. It's not simply in a place like Poland or in Hungary. You're seeing it in Turkey right now, where the Syrian refugees in Turkey are a major political issue. In fact, the new mayor of Istanbul largely campaigned on and ran on all sorts of promises to, like, get rid of Arabic signs in the city, right? So all around the world, we're seeing huge amounts of people moving and huge disruption to politics around that migration. And in a lot of ways, this is going to be the central challenge for us in this century. I really, truly believe that. Like, the central challenge is climate and making sure that we have a habitable planet and we don't cook the earth past a kind of disastrous tipping point. But embedded in that is the fact that a lot of people are going to move to a lot of new places. And we are going to have to figure out as societies how to create stable, equitable, welcoming multiracial, multiethnic, multilingual democracies that give 
dignity and equality to the stranger. The best traditions of America are that, right? I mean, America really is a a unique place in its immigration history. It's a place in which on the ashes of ethnic cleansing and dislocation of indigenous populations and on the backs of slavery, a society was built that also produced a kind of creedal nationalism that welcomed all kinds of different people from all kinds of different places. The welcoming was really fraught in a lot of places. There were all kinds of reactionary anti-immigrant groups. There's a piece of legislation literally called the Chinese Exclusion Act, which, I mean, points for accuracy. You can guess what the legislation does. (laughs) There are these two strains in America, right? There's the kind of like, there's which we talk about all the time. There is like the legacy of white supremacy oppression and dislocation of indigenous peoples and the sort of pure evil of that. And there is, in fits and starts, in ebbs and flows, at different moments, through this sort of process of extremely difficult trial and error and social mobilization, a vision of a real welcoming and multiracial democracy. And you know that that's like, in some ways, the project of this podcast is to talk about that. But it's also the project of, of today's guest. Um, who is an incredible guy, an incredible author. His name is Suketu Mehta, and he wrote essentially a kind of um, manifesto about his vision of America welcoming the stranger, what it means for America to appeal to the better angels of its nature with respect to immigration. He lived it. It's called This Land is Our Land, an Immigrant's Manifesto. Suketu immigrated here as a teenager, as you'll hear, from uh, India, but he's a New Yorker and American through and through. He wrote an incredible book about Mumbai, Bombay, that's called Maximum City, in which he moved his family there and wrote this, like, just mind-blowing book about how wild that city is, which I would recommend to you. He is working on, and has been working on for, like, I think more than 10 years, a similar book about New York City, which I cannot wait to read. In the interim, and in the Trump era, he said he felt compelled, with his distinct and unique perspective, to write a book, a manifesto, a sort of creed de corps about America as a land of strangers, and how beautiful and sublime that is and can be, and what that means, and how much right now that is being threatened and imperiled by Donald Trump and Donald Trumpism. Suketu, where are you from? Uh Uh-huh. That's the question, right? (laughs) I'm starting with the most most loaded of questions. Exactly. Where (laughs) am I from? The planet Earth, the mothership. (laughs) Well, I was born in Calcutta. My mother's from Nairobi. I grew up in Bombay, and when I was 14, I came to Jackson Heights. So I used to answer, you know, this question, where are you from? Growing up in Queens, I'd say, from Bombay. But increasingly now, when I go around the world, I say I'm from New York. I've uh, lived in Queens, I've lived in Brooklyn, I now live in Manhattan. So, yes, I'm from the planet Earth. When you came with your family, you described some of this in the book, it's actually a sort of harrowing moment when your mother's passport is basically rejected. The Germans, you fly through Germany to come to New York and your mother sort of rendered a stateless person at the border because she's a passport that had been issued to sort of subjects of the British Empire in Nairobi, right? But you end up here. What's your recollection of that experience? I always, you know, I have friends who, I've got a very good friend who grew up in uh, Russia and immigrated when she was 10 and other friends who came here and it must be such an intense experience. So, you know, it was better than coming across the Atlantic Ocean in chains for traveling in steerage, but we had this very strange experience where we all had green cards, or we were supposed to be, we were approved to come and stay in the United States and live here. Green cards were waiting for us at JFK Airport. Uh, I was 14, my sisters were 7 and 2, and we just had to transit through Germany from Frankfurt to Cologne and then get on a flight from Cologne to JFK. But at the Frankfurt airport, the German passport control officer looks at my father's Indian passport and, you know, mine and my sister's Indian passport and we're fine. But my mother's British passport, it was a passport given by Great Britain to citizens of the former Commonwealth that basically had no value. You couldn't take that passport and live in the country which was issuing that passport. You couldn't go to Britain. You couldn't go to Britain. And it's just countries. like, here's a document. Exactly. <laughs> so just, just have your name on it. And, you know, if you need a passport, here, take this and 
uh, make of it what you will. So then the passport control of uh, looks at my mother's passport and says, um, sorry, you can't transit through Germany. So we had to figure out what we were going to do now because my mother was essentially a stateless person in Germany. And, you know, it was kind of humiliating for us, this little family looking to get to America. And I don't understand what the passport control officer was thinking. Was my mom just going to make a break for it and live by herself in Germany while the rest of us went to America? It made no sense. So then we ended up going on a an Air India plane that happened to be leaving from Frankfurt to go to New York. And we were all bundled on this plane. And I remember on this plane, as we get in, there was this drunk guy who'd gotten on at Delhi. And the stewardess shakes the guy who's sleeping and says, Sir, where are you getting off? And she says, huh, where am I? And she says, well, you're in Frankfurt. Says, oh my God, I need to get off here. <laughs> so if we hadn't gotten on the plane, he would have stayed on the plane and woken up in New York. So it was an absurd journey throughout. And then when we get to JFK, our first apartment in the country was a studio apartment in Jackson Heights. And there were five of us crammed in the studio apartment. And the super turned off the lights the first night because there were too many people in the studio apartment. This was his way of being like, I don't, I don't approve of how many people you have packed into my right, apartment exactly. I'm renting you. Yeah, yeah, he so you like, won't get electricity. Yeah. yeah, no no electricity. Which didn't bother us because we were from Bombay where the lights went out every night. So it was like, <laughs> we were home. We joke, jo- joke's on him. <laughs> we were right. <laughs> and I remember going out to Roosevelt Avenue and looking at the elevated number seven train, you know, this rusty train and this strange half yellow light of the New York streets and wondering, where is the Statue of Liberty? What was the first period of time for you as a teenager, which is a hard time for anyone in any situation, if you're in a completely homogenous environment in a small town or you're from, like me, if you grew up in New York, which I did and traversed the city, it's hard. You're looking to fit in anyway. What was that like for you? So my early years in Jackson Heights were really miserable. My parents put me into the nearest, uh, what in India we might call a convent school. So it's a Catholic school, Catholic school because yeah. the Catholic schools are the good ones in India. And they put me into the nearest Catholic school, which was this extravagantly racist institution. It was this all-boys school where I was among the first minorities. I was a meat thrown to the lion. So I remember my second day in the school, this uh, white kid with red hair and freckles coming up to me and glaring at me and saying, Lincoln should have never let him off the plantations. And I said, but what's that got to do with me? Wow. Wow. Uh, wow. Saying, Welcome to America. That was uh, the opening line. Lincoln never should have left them off the plantation. Yeah. And in, New, I, in New York City in 1977. 1977, exactly. Jeez. It was... Well, in Queens. In in Queens, uh, home of uh, the current president. That's so, right. Ho- Ar- Queens that gave us Archie Bunker and Donald Trump. Exactly. And this boy... And there's a relationship between those three. Yeah. I mean, the, the, Queens, the most diverse county in the United States, yeah. statistically, also home of the least diverse human being uh, in the country. Yeah. Um, so, but this is why I, I feel like I really understand uh, Trump's makeup because I grew up in this place where, you know, the fathers of the kids I went to school with were essentially uh, Donald Trump's. East Elmhurst, where my school was located, was this white enclave, working class white enclave, which was steadily being encroached upon by all these minorities, Indians, Bangladeshis, Colombians, God knows who. And for these Renting fathers, studios with five people in them. Right, exactly. With the strange smelling foods yes. and their, you know, Bollywood songs. And so the school was ridiculous. I mean, the teachers called me a pagan. I mean, I had to run for my life many days of the school day. But the building that I grew up was quite another story. So we had people from all over the planet. We had Indians and Pakistanis, we had Haitians and Dominicans, Russians, Jews, Muslims. The super was a Greek, but the building was owned by a Turkish man. These were all people, Chris, who were killing each other just before they got on the plane. Yeah, the Pakistanis and Indians and Turks and the Greeks, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. And we're all, here we are living in the same building, and the only thing we had in common was Sunday morning, there was a TV station, a Spanish language TV station, WNJU from Linden, Newark, which broadcast a Bollywood musical program called Vision of Asia, Sunday mornings. And the entire building, the Indians, Pakistanis, Dominicans, Russians, all sang along to the Bollywood songs. <laughs> because that's the one thing we had in common. Now, it's not that we 
all loved each other and understood each other. It wasn't a paradise of racial tolerance, but we'd agreed to suffer each other. We all yeah. said extravagantly racist things about each other when we got back into our homes. Ah, oh, these Pakistanis, they eat all this meat. How can... Um, I mean, this is part, it's funny you say that because it's part of the cosmopolitan nature of New York City exists side by side with incredible amounts of racial stereotyping and ethnic stereotyping from every group to every other group, right? I mean, like, I, I remember, you know, in the Bronx, there's a lot of Puerto Ricans and Dominicans and Dominican friends about Puerto Ricans saying, like, wild, crazy, obviously false stuff, generalizing about, like, Puerto Ricans all do this. I'm like, I don't think that's true. Like, Dominicans don't wash their clothes. I'm like, I don't, that's not true. They, of course they wash their clothes. What are you talking about? But, like, these stereotypes, these sort of ethnic group, you know, stereotypes were like so powerful. And it is a weird way that like those sit aside the kind of agreeing to suffer each other. That is what a functioning, tolerant, cosmopolitan society or city looks like. It's really quite marvelous. The Jewish center in Jackson Heights, there used to be a lot of Jews in Jackson Heights until the 70s, 80s, and they started going out to the suburbs. So it's a community center with a lot of space. The Jewish Center of Jackson Heights hosts the annual iftar celebrations for the Muslim community there. Mm. Because there isn't enough community space for the Jews will happily let it out to the Muslims, to the Christians. So the clash of civilizations makes a joyous sound in Jackson Heights. Okay, but I want to, let's zero in on this a little bit, because this gets to sort of the broader themes of your book. One of the things I like about the book is it sort of moves between the particular and the universal. This desire to move to new places happens all over the world in all sorts of conditions. And fear and resentment of the new person coming in happens in all kinds of places. I mean, you you mentioned this in the book, right? Like Bangladeshis coming over to India, subject of tremendous, terrible, sometimes violent xenophobia. Right now there's incidents in South America where Colombians have, you know, taken to the streets to protest against Venezuelans who are there from next door. What's the recipe? What makes the culture work when these fear, resentment of the stranger is so universal, and even in the multicultural little apartment complex. What's the difference between the world that's instantiated there and the world that's instantiated in your Catholic school where you are the subject of really nasty racist bullying? So I think Jackson Heights points the way forward. The reason Jackson Heights works is because no one community predominates. You can't scapegoat, say, Dominicans or Indians because there's Plenty of Dominicans and Indians and everyone else, Russians, Poles, Chinese, you name it. So that's one answer not to cluster uh, mm -hmm. immigrants in these ghettos. Another is there were people in my building who would have liked to beat up other people because of their ethnicity. You know, there were kids who called each other all kinds of racist names. But they also know that in this country, or at least in New York City, the hate crimes laws are enforced. My sister, who was also bullied and you know beaten up in her elementary school in Queens when we came here, she grew up to become an assistant district attorney in Queens and she was prosecuting hate crimes after 9-11. So there has to be a recognition that you could have really bad impulses, but you can't act on them because you will be held to account. Now, this was not true in South Asia, where I came from. I've written a book about Bombay in which I write about how Hindus slaughtered Muslims with impunity in the 1992-93 riots in Bombay. And I actually spoke to these murderers and they walked around the streets completely unpunished. Their political leaders were unpunished. The man that runs the country now. That's right. Essentially yeah. someone who in previous roles incited this kind of violence. In 2002, there was a, an anti-Muslim pogrom in Gujarat, which Narendra Modi, who's now the prime minister, he was chief minister of the state during the time and did absolutely nothing to stop these rampaging mobs. In fact, uh, there are indications that he moved the state machinery to yeah. assist these mobs. So, you know, it's not enough to say you guys can live here and everyone's welcome. The legal machinery has to be in place mm. to stop people from acting on their worst impulses. What is your observation? In some ways, I think you, you say this in the book, this sort of forms the inspiration for writing the book, but the trajectory of immigrant life, understanding of immigration's role in the U.S. over the trajectory of your life from the time you were 14 in 1977 to the Trump era. So I went to uh, this Catholic school in Queens and somehow survived it and then, you know, went on to NYU 
Uh, but my parents were afraid I'd be Americanized if I lived in the dorm. So I had to stay home and commute from Jackson Heights to NYU. And now I, I said, I'm getting into NYU housing one way or the other. So I'm an NYU professor now. And I, <laughs> I go to... You, got, you showed them. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and I did a reverse commute because I go to Jackson Heights you to study you. these people. So yeah. I'm in a, a, a glorified kind of NYU dorm. But, you know, it's, every year that I was here since 1977... I became more and more confident in my place in the country. And wherever I'd go abroad, I, I've lived in Paris, I've lived in London, I've lived in Sao Paulo, I went back to Bombay for two and a half years to write my book. And I'd feel this gladness when I came back to America, when mm. I saw... Visceral. Absolutely. You know, when the plane would go over the Long Island, as you come in and you look at it, and then there's, you're descending into JFK, which is not an aesthetically pleasing airport, but still you felt great to come out and you know there was some cabbie from Uzbekistan or whatever who'd take your bags and then you it, it just all each time I came back to America I felt happy and I felt you know more and more like yeah this is my place America New York is the last home for those who have no other home until 2016 that horrible bleak November day my students at NYU were weeping on the streets and there were all these people assuring us, it's all right, you know, Trump may have said extreme things during the election, but now he's president, he's got to be presidential, and every president has to be a president for all Americans. So that's the year that it really changed. And since then, since 2016, with every month, I've felt my position in the country being openly challenged. Those kids in my Catholic school who threw incredibly racist abuse at me, I realized they now, you know, run the country and they're in power. So this is new. And that's why I wrote this book, because I believe in the country. And just like I fought those kids in the Catholic school, going to fight the bigots who now occupy the highest offices in the land. Do you do you experience that firsthand, that feeling? I mean, is that a is that a kind of ethereal feeling or is it is it a daily experience? I write in the book about an experience I had with my sister last Thanksgiving. We decided that we were going to get a drink in Hoboken in New Jersey because Hoboken had just elected a Sikh mayor. And as we were walking across the street, this car pulled up with these young white kids who were just yelling all kinds of things at us. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and they were gesticulating and making obscene gestures. And I put my middle, middle finger up at them, and this guy jumps out of the car, and he was this very stockily built white bro. I, I'm not ashamed to say that he would have beaten me to a pulp. We duck into a restaurant, we call the cops. The guy jumps out, but he, he doesn't come into the restaurant, but he's still yelling all this abuse at me and my sister, and and the cops come and this white cop asks, you know, what's the matter? And I tell him, I said, so what were they yelling? And I said, Allahu Akbar. And he said, what does it mean? I said, it means God is great in Arabic. So he said, what's wrong with that? And then I had to explain to him that he thought we were Muslims. And he, say, he looks at me and my sister and says, well, you don't look Muslim, you look Indian. And of course, I had to explain to him that India is the second biggest Muslim country in the world. There's 200 million Muslims and it doesn't matter if we're... Right, Indian. yeah, it's missing the point, really. And then he's like, well, you know, what were you doing? Uh, I said, we were crossing the street. I said, well, did you press the walk button before you walked the street? I said, what, you going to get me for jaywalking now? So again, it was this absurd encounter, but the point was that there was this car full of kids, again, who could have come from my high school days, the bullies of my high school, and they were yelling the exact same insults, but they'd felt emboldened now in Trump's presidency, that they... They, they felt that this country was theirs. And even in a city which was nominally run by a Sikh mayor, they could drive around the streets yelling at people who weren't white. And this was new. This hasn't happened to me basically since high school, but it's now happening to me again. And it's happening to me all over again now that I hear the president yelling at these four women of color, congresswomen of color, go back to where you came from. This is exactly the same phrase that those bullies in my Catholic school used. Go back to where you came from. I did not think I would hear it in America, from the president of America in 2019. There's something really specific about that phrase, isn't there? It's so, 
I mean, I, I've had over the last few days conversations with so many people, African Americans, Americans of different racial and ethnic backgrounds, and also immigrants. Everybody has a story of the first time they were told that and the poison of it. Look, every immigrant group that's come to the country uh, has had this phrase thrown at them. Um, the Irish had it, the Italians had it, the Jews had it. And it hurts. It hurts every time because you come here and you really want to contribute to the country. And you think that this is one place where you can be American. I've lived in England. I never thought I could be English. I've lived in France. I never imagined I could be French. But yeah, this is America. And I was told, and this is the foundational myth of the country, that it's a country of immigrants. You can come here and be American. But there's also this other side of America, which is where people get told, you don't belong here, you're not like us. And I actually am reminded of a gentleman named Ben Franklin, who in 1751 writes about the alien menace that is invading Pennsylvania at the time. Quote, why should the Palatine boars be suffered to swarm into our settlements and by herding together establish their language and manners to the exclusion of ours? Why should Pennsylvania, founded by the English, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglifying them and will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion? He's talking about Germans, <laughs> the ancestors of our current president, Palatine Boers, indeed. I mean, what's what's so remarkable about this, and this came up in a conversation with Patrick Radden Keefe, who I think is a, a friend of yours, was on the podcast, and you're, you're reading about Northern Ireland, right? All, all ethnic and racial hatred from enough distance looks preposterous, ridiculous. I mean, it looks like the Dr. Seuss, which side of the bread do you butter it on? That's comical. Like, what the hell are you talking about? But of course, that's true of everything. Every single one of them, every single one that with a culture you're embedded in, where it seems wrong or vile but not preposterous, is as preposterous as that statement. Every bit of ethnic, stereotyping, bigotry, hatred, tribal, confessional, whatever it is, is literally that preposterous. But it doesn't feel that way to people in the moment, to huge swaths of people, even very wise and smart people like Benjamin Franklin. This is why I think um, that the best way to fight this kind of bigotry is stand-up comedy. To really show it up for how preposterous it is. At some point, it gets so bad that it, it becomes funny. And you have to mock these people. But it's not funny when, you know, these people hold the, the levers of power. Who, they can actually do something about it. They can change the laws so that not just legal immigrants, but naturalized citizens can be unnaturalized. If the Justice Department has a task force to go after naturalized American citizens now. I don't know if. Those laws could be used against people who uh, disagree with American policy. If um, There's all kinds of really crazy thoughts running through every immigrant's mm. head right now. Mm. There's kind of paranoia, but okay. paranoia is not paranoia if it's justified. Um, yeah, my, my, my therapist calls it catastrophizing, you know, like yeah. the sort of thinking of the worst case scenario. But that's a, it, an entirely rational set of mental exercises to do for so many communities right now. Well, these ICE raids that are now supposed to defend across the country now. You know, I, I know people. I know undocumented families. And I know undocumented, semi-documented, and fully documented families all living together. Yep. So there they could be like a family in which, you know, someone doesn't have papers. Someone is going through the process of getting papers. Someone already has papers. Someone's already a citizen. But if the state comes knocking at your door and you let them in, they're going to arrest everyone. So all across communities like Jackson Heights, uh, you know, through much of New York, there's this kind of fear of the state, of the midnight knock, which is like Stalinist Russia. I never thought that, you know, we'd see the country uh, come to this pass. I want to drill down on what I think is a, a really interesting philosophical tension in your book about people's right to move. So let's talk about that right after this. You talk about, and I, I think I maybe knew this somewhere but had not really remembered it or meditated on the fact that part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is adopted by the United Nations in sort of the founding set of documents is that people have the right to move. <laughs> so a fundamental, a really fu important fundamental right is that you can leave the country you're in. We all recognize that, right? Why is the wall there in 
East Germany. It's not there to stop people from coming in. It's there to stop people from leaving. And we all understand that a country that stops its people from leaving, like, say, North Korea, is just definitionally tyrannical. You can leave if you want to go, right? But then there's like, well, okay, well, if you leave, you got to go somewhere, right? And there's also embedded in that document the right to petition for political asylum. There isn't quite the right to go anywhere you want. Should it be the case that it is a universal human right to pick up and move to the country of your choice? But that's the question of open borders. Does a nation have the right to control who comes in, how many they let in? You know, and it's a very complex issue. I'd like to first point out that this whole question of borders and passports and visas is only about 100 years old in Mm -hmm. our long history on the planet. We human beings have only started thinking about this question about a century ago. Before that, in the age of mass migration from the middle of the 19th century to around uh, 1914, fully one quarter of Europe up and moved to the United States. And what happened? The republic did not collapse. No, in fact, the opposite. (laughs) It was part of what converted it into a sort of colonial backwater into a superpower. Exactly. The the, The U.S. removed Europe as at the pinnacle of world wealth and power because it had an open border. Not only that, this is my favorite fact, and you write about this in the book, when people say, well, my ancestors came legally. It's like we had open borders. Like they came legally because literally there was one rule, no Chinese. It's called the Chinese Exclusion Act. (laughs) And it, it had a quota on the Chinese. And everyone else, it was like, Come on down. Yep. That was the legal posture of American immigration policy for decades. So in my book, I also consider these arguments by serious philosophers, not just crackpots, who say that any kind of collective has the right to define rules for membership. Or there's this lifeboat theory that the United States is a um, lifeboat in an ocean and there are lots of people swimming around. And if too many people get on the lifeboat, then everyone thinks both the newcomers on the lifeboat and people who've been there before. So, you know, and so I've considered these arguments, but I really can't find any evidence that if tomorrow we were to suddenly open up our borders, and there's a lot of people who'd like to move to the United States. Well, first of all, GDP would increase enormously. There's a statistic that if the world had open borders, then world GDP would increase by $78 trillion a year. When people move, everyone benefits. If the United States were to adopt a policy, let's say, short of open borders, for every 1 million people that we Mm -hmm. bring in, the GDP will increase by 1.15%. So there's there's just no doubt that uh, immigration benefits the countries that the immigrants move to, particularly the rich countries, because we're not making enough babies, and we need young, motivated immigrants to work because the United States by the middle of the century is going to be a nation of givers. As the baby boomers retire, there's not enough working age adults to pay for the pensions of the old people. If you want to see the future of America, go to a big facility for seniors, particularly in like a metro area like New York, assisted living where it is like old white folks being cared for by 30-year-old immigrants and people of color. That's it. Like, that's it. That's that's the future <laughs> of, of the country in many respects. That's it. Look, the replacement rate is 2.1 babies per woman. The United States replacement rate today is, stands at 1.7 babies per woman. And you see this around the world. Japan, under 4% of the Japanese population is foreign-born. It's ridiculous. It's one of the most closed-off societies to immigration of any, of any. probably it is the most closed-off to immigration of any first-world country, I think it's probably exactly, fair to say. Exactly, yeah, yeah, because they want to keep their culture pure. Yeah. So as a result, their economy has stagnated. And in the villages of the north, there's only old people left because all the young people have moved to the cities of the south. And uh, they've been invaded by wild boars from the mountains. So it's a common sight to see these old men and women being chased by wild boars in the villages. The Washington Post had this fascinating article about this where old Japanese people are being menaced by wild boars because there's not enough young people to chase off the wild boars. Is this what we want for our country? (laughs) Wild boars chasing our old people? You know, bring in the immigrants. Well, the Japanese also have realized that they need more immigrants because they need labor. Mm. So they're actually very cautiously opening up their doors. They're trying to recruit high-skilled immigrants but not enough people want to move there because they feel it's a hostile 
atmosphere for them. But I, I have to say that the, the economic argument always leaves me a little cold. Or I just it just sort of feels like it's a hard thing to persuade people of. You know, yeah. it always feels a little like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is trying to sell me on something when I hear <laughs> when I hear this argument, which I, I think is backed up by the vast majority of economists and wonks with a small dissenting group of economists and wonks. Yeah, there's uh, basically one man, George Borhas, Borhas who is, yes, Borhas, who's the famous uh, contrarian on, on, on precisely this. He's the guy that you will see cited in every bit of literature and pamphlets from the sort of anti-immigration coalition. I guess what I'm trying to get back around to is the basic moral principle. Like, there are times when I think to myself, it seems possible to me, there's two things I feel it's about, eat, eating meat and immigration, where it seems possible to me that in 100 years, people will look back on the current policy is like obviously barbaric, that it just makes no sense that just the natural lottery of where you happen to be born essentially determined all your life outcomes. And like if you're born in a slum in Bangladesh, like too bad, got to stay there, can't go to the United States because like that's just your SOL, buddy. And like at some level, it's like that's morally indefensible. Why is that the case? It shouldn't be that way. And yet it's crazy and radical to say like, no, they should be able to come here because you know, then we have a billion people who move to the U.S., right? There's all these sort of catastrophizing thoughts we have about what that would look like. But I don't know. Like, maybe that's right. I don't know. <laughs> for, the, for the central point of my book is a moral argument that all these people, and you're right, the greatest inequality in the world today is the inequality of citizenship, the citizenship lottery. I can predict a person's life depending on the passport that he or she yeah. holds. But the question I ask is, why is it that Bangladesh is in the state it's in right now. And the nation that's caused Bangladesh's misery, the United Kingdom and Europe and the United States because of climate change, why is it that these Bangladeshis have to endure what they're enduring, uh, which is uh, the possible extinction of their country by the end of the century because of climate change? It's not their fault. They are coming here because we were there. The British went into South Asia, stayed there for 200 years, and destroyed the economy. When the British arrived in India at the beginning of the 18th century, India's share of, by India I mean all of South Asia, India's share of world GDP was 23%. By the time they left 200 years later in 1947, India's share was 4% of world GDP. So basically, you know, the colonial empire was run for the benefit yeah of England and France, who together made up 40% of all the borders in the world. So Bangladesh is in its current condition because first the British looted it, prevented it from building up its industries. And now, I mean, we're worried about 4 million Syrians going into Germany because of a war. What happens when Bangladesh gets flooded and 400 million Bangladeshis have to find dry land? Where are they going to go? Well, here's the thing. They're going to go. This is what is super crazy. They're going to go to India and Pakistan. Right. And and this is what's so wild. I mean, people, you know, the U.S. barricading itself behind the walls. You know, when you I mean, Colombia has got a million Venezuelans, a million. Colombia is a much smaller. Can you imagine if a million folks showed up? We're freaking out because several hundred thousand a month are showing up at the border from all of Central America. There were several million Iraqis in Damascus alone at the worst periods of the sectarian civil war in Iraq. In one city. And, you know, it creates lots of tension. There's lots of fights. There's the mayor of Istanbul is on a new crusade to get rid of Arabic signs because there's so many Syrian refugees in Istanbul. But the level of migration between developing countries and refugee populations that developing countries are constantly asked to take in and the burden they bear from Jordan to Colombia to India to all across the developing world for the first world to be like, no, this is outrageous. It's crazy. It is crazy. Exactly. The vast majority of world migrants, 85%, move from a poor to a slightly less poor. That's right. Yep. We think most, of that's ourselves most, as, most migration. You know, the, the, the right wing, if you were to look at Fox News, you'd think, oh my God, we're so generous. We let in a million migrants for you. We rank 23rd in the world in terms of how many immigrants we let in as a percentage of our population. If we tripled our intake, we wouldn't even be in the top five. And even among developed countries, Australia, Canada, they take in far more immigrants than we do. Germany takes in far more immigrants than we do as a percentage of a population. So America is, you know, no longer a nation of immigrants. Officially, we're no longer a nation of immigrants because that phrase was removed from the Citizenship and Immigration Services website earlier this year because 
the Trump administration doesn't think of the country as a nation of immigrants. But the argument, so I want to make the argument, the argument that the restrictionists make, and I'm trying to, I've spent a lot of time going back and forth with these people and reporting on immigration, so I, I feel like I can give their arguments. Mm-hmm. The argument that restrictionists make, and I, I will choose like the kind of most enlightened of them and the the least racist. Uh, Raihan Salam is one who's got a book out who, who himself is a child of Bangladeshi immigrants, a friend of mine and someone I, I like and respect. It is more about sort of national character and also this argument about periods of big flows followed by periods of small flows, right? So we had this huge burst, as you say, and then 1914, and then there's a long period in which there's very little immigration relatively. It lasts until basically the 1960s, Immigration Nationalization Act, INA. So you've got about 50 years where the idea being that like, look, it's hard to bring different groups together. If you've grown up in an apartment in New York, you know there's some friction and you need this sort of period of sort of homogenizing where everyone can kind of like all Americanize together. But if you keep adding to the mix and you keep bringing in new people, you're disrupting this process that's important to sort of the civic binding. It's like you're not letting the concrete set. Right. I'm familiar with this argument and it's hogwash. Um, Look, New York City is exhibit A in showing that immigration works. New York City is now at historically unprecedented levels of number of immigrants it takes, even as a percentage of its population, we're approaching the highs of the early 20th century. Two out of three New Yorkers are immigrants or their children. New York has never been richer. New York has never been safer. There's no evidence that these alleged waves of immigrants are actually disturbing the peace or that it's making people poorer. However, well, it, but it the, is, the, the argument yeah. is that New York has never also been more unequal. Right. I mean, there's a connection between that. You basically have huge swaths of a constantly growing pool of cheap labor that comes in the form of immigration and then a bunch of plutocrats at top. And like that's the system they want to set up. Right. But the inequality wasn't caused by the immigrants. Uh, The anti-immigration backlash is something that the plutocrats use. Yes. And this is I have a whole chapter in my book and it's a phrase that Hannah Arendt uses the alliance between the mob and capital. So I took a trip in that dread year 2016, in the summer of 2016, a road trip from California to uh, New York. And I went through industrial Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, Trump country. And I remember going to this factory town called Warren, Pennsylvania. And this was a place where there was this one company, the Blair Company, that made raincoats for American GIs during the war, basically employed everyone in the war. Now, when I walked through it in 2016, it was a zombie town. There were young white men and women in this empty town, stumbling through the streets at noon, and they were basically hooked on opioids. The only industry left there was either the drug trade or the military. So these people had been gobsmacked by automation, the loss of jobs, and they were angry. You know, most of them voted for Trump. And they were wondering, like, what happened to their money? So Steve Bannon once said that the origins of the current way of nationalism, not just in America, but in Europe, originated in a 2008 financial crisis. Now, I don't agree with Bannon on much, but this is one thing where I feel he has a point. Mm. These people's money was stolen. And where did it go? To the plutocrats. It went to Wall Street. The government bailed out the bankers. America has never been more unequal. The top 1% make more than the bottom 90%. But the plutocrats, the rich being no fools, knew that the peasants were coming for them with pitchforks. And if they didn't direct their rage away from them, then all hell would break loose. They'd lose their Porsches and their fancy condominiums. So they directed the outrage away from them and onto the newest, the weakest, the immigrants. See, I I think that part of that story is true, but I think there's part of that that's not true because I think part of it was actually organic. I I mean, having covered this, I think one of the things you saw with the Republican Party was the plutocrats didn't like all the anti-immigrant rhetoric. There's even reporting about Rupert Murdoch setting up meetings where the Republicans go to talk to Sean Hannity about, like, don't do the like Murdoch is setting them up. Right. Because it's actually bubbling up organically from the base. You know, the anti-immigrant rhetoric, it's there are people who are cultivating at the top and Donald Trump is one of them. But it's also a bottom up phenomenon. I mean, people are showing up at town halls and Republicans are getting their hair blown back. Eric Cantor is the perfect example, right? He's the plutocrat's best friend. He's a Wall Street Republican guy, and he loses this shock primary to an insurgent who basically goes after him solely on immigration. So I I think there's like, I mean, the, the reason I say that is because one of the things I feel like that we all have to deal with in this era is 
the universality of that rage, anger, fear of the newcomer as a human experience that people are experiencing and channeling because we have to deal with it head on and look at it clear eyed or it will literally destroy the world. And I mean that literally. It will destroy the world. We will end up in either a world war or we will cook the planet unless we can figure out how to get people over that fear. Don't you agree? So I totally agree that in the beginning, the never Trump of the country club Republicans, they held that no, they they didn't like Trump. When he was in office, he gave them the biggest Christmas gift in history, the tax cut. Yes. And now they're all behind him. Yes. And he is planning to get reelected on the basis of immigrant hatred. Uh, This is going to be his signature policy and all the plutocrats are behind him and they've never been richer. But is that, I mean, but Trump is, as you write in the book, he's part of this broader phenomenon. I mean, we see it in Poland and Hungary. We've seen it in the UK with Brexit. We've seen it in Italy. I mean, Italy is particularly a place that I've lived for six months and is near and dear to my heart where there is extremely ugly, ugly, ugly anti-immigrant rhetoric and policies from the interior minister, Matteo Salvini. This is a global phenomenon right now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I've gone around the world and looked at this phenomenon in Hungary, in Spain, Morocco. I've spoken to all these migrants coming over. So, yes, there is populists around the world, whether it's Trump or Orban in Hungary or Duterte in the Philippines or Erdogan in Turkey or Modi in India. And a populist is basically a gifted storyteller. Someone who can tell a false story well. And the way to fight them is by telling a true story better. Mm. So I think you're right that a lot of the resistance to migration is cultural. You know, people, they're afraid of the country being non-white. Most of the people who voted for Brexit, the biggest own goal in British history, weren't people living in London. They were white English people living in rural England. And the people who had everyday, day-to-day lived experience of immigrants, really liked the immigrants and voted to remain. And it's the exact, literally the exact same thing in Le Pen votes in France. It's the same thing in Trump votes in the U.S. I mean, an absolute iron law of all this is that people who are not immigrants in the most cosmopolitan areas with have the most exported immigrants are the most pro-immigrant populations in every respective country. Right. Like so many other things, it's an urban-rural divide. Yeah. And the other thing, you know, the other part of my writing career is about cities. The biggest human development of our lifetimes is that for the first time in human history, more people are living in cities than in villages. So all across the world, there's a stampede to the cities. The fir- it is the first time in human history. This the is first important. time in human history. And in fact, the biggest migration in the world is the internal migration of Chinese rural folk to the Chinese cities. That, right. that, that alone is the largest internal migration that's ever happened. Right. But there is a backlash to this migration. There is this idea of the city as Sodom and Gomorrah. The city as this entryway to the foreign forces. There's a backlash of homogeneity against heterogeneity. There's huge parts of America that think that Jackson Heights is not an attractive place to be. That's not. They don't want to turn into Jackson Heights, and they don't have to. No. You know, I've lived in Iowa for three years, and Iowa is a perfectly fine place. It's and lovely, I, but the food is better in Jackson Heights. The food is much better in Jackson Heights. So, uh, I went actually from Jackson Heights to Iowa City, from the most diverse county in the United States to the home of the world's biggest hog. And that hog was impressive, let me tell you. It had its own zip code. Um, But I can completely understand, you know, why Iowans might like to keep Iowa what it is. But then they also have to realize that these people who want to come to Iowa from El Salvador and from Guatemala, they don't want to come there to hang out with the world's biggest hog. They're coming there because we have left them no choice. They are coming to Iowa and to Illinois and to New York because Americans have gone into these countries and ruined their countries for decades now. Anytime there's been any kind of decent government that could have come up in these countries, the United States armed forces have toppled them in favor of malleable despots in these countries. At one point, the United Fruit Company owned 42% of all the land in Guatemala. We put 1.8 million guns in Honduras to arm the Contras during the Nicaraguan conflict. So these countries are coming here. And and what I say strongly in my book is that people are moving not because they hate their homes or their families, but because of colonialism, war, inequality, and climate change. These people are coming here because we have literally made their homelands uninhabitable. So I want to turn the tables on the whole 
migration debate. Not ask so much, is it good for us Americans to let in immigrants? Should we let in high-skilled or low-skilled immigrants? How many should we let in? But ask, look at it from the migrants' point of view. Why are they moving in the first place? Why would someone take their daughter in their hands and swim across the Rio Grande? Why would someone take such incredible risks for their children? Because, like that, you know, that horrific photo of that father and daughter who were drowned in the Rio Grande. You know, I looked into that story. They were working in this minimum wage jobs in this uh, fast food places, and there was no life possible for them in El Salvador. As climate change really kicks in, this is, you know, you ain't seen nothing yet. No, I mean, this is what I, I'm obsessed with this because I think people underappreciate that we're on the front edge of what will be the largest migrant. But we're already seeing the largest migrant flows in yeah. the history of the world, yeah. but they will increase exponentially as climate disaster hits with unequal force in different parts of the world and particularly hits the hottest places, which are also the least developed places, which are also the most exposed places. And also the least responsible for the climate And crisis. the least responsible you know, morally. Americans are 4% of the world's population, but we put one third of the excess carbon in the atmosphere, the EU another quarter. It's our responsibility. So if we're not going to let them in, the least we can do is flood these countries with aid so that they stay down on the farm. There's a, there's a giant moral bill that is due to the West. And it's a bill that can be paid one of two ways. Either we pay them what they're owed in terms of reparations, or we do the reparations another way. We let their people in. Hmm. And when we let the people in, everyone benefits. We benefit because we're not making enough babies. They benefit because it's the difference between life and death, literally, for many of them. And the countries that they move from benefit because remittances are the best and most targeted way of helping the global poor. This is the money that people in Jackson Heights, you know, they go to these Giro stations and they send back like $100, $200 to their grandmothers, to their children, to their cousins for medical treatment, for education, to build a small home. So when people, you know, move, everyone benefits, but it'll take some time for people to get accustomed to this culturally in the receiving countries. And I think that's the argument that the restrictions make about a kind of cultural accommodation. And there are ways to deal with that as well. So there's there's two ways, I think, to look at where we're at. And I think that your book lays this out starkly, right? One is the optimistic way, which is the California example, right? And it's based on both history and the fact that, as I said earlier, places that have the most exposure to immigrants are the most pro-immigrant, right? So, uh, you know, it's only a matter of time when you get to know them, you love them, mm. right? You know, and, know, know them if you love, love, love them. That's right. That's right. And so California went through this, you know, it had a lot of immigrants. It had this massive and ugly nativist backlash. It had a Republican governor who aligned himself with that nativist backlash. And that nativist backlash won a temporary, a small temporary victory that led to long-term strategic defeat that basically took California from being a swing state and actually the birthplace of a certain kind of conservatism, Ronald Reagan, Richard Nixon, et cetera, to being like a permanent supermajority blue state Democratic. So that's one idea, right? That we're just inevitably heading in that direction. And this is the last gasp. It's a dead cat bounce. The other is that we're in, you know, the global situation that is in 1935, 36, where proto-fascist forces are gathering strength as populist movements of reaction across the Western world that will inevitably lead to conflagration. Which is it? Both. <laughs> There's definitely incredibly alarming things happening in Europe and, you know, I've been traveling around there and it's, yeah, the fascists are coming back to power and in this country as well with the rise of the, of the alt-right. There's this one number which strikes fear into the hearts of the alt-right here, which is 2044, which is when the country is slated to become majority-minority. But then what does the term white mean and what's it going to mean by 2044? Is Obama half white or half black? I never understood that concept of white and black in, in this country. When I first came to the country, I had to take off Caucasian on my census form. So there wasn't a separate category for Asian Indians. and my ancestors um, would have been gladdened to know that in this country we were actually Caucasian and not brown or, you know, finally we could be white too. Um, and with the rate of intermarriage that we're seeing, it's accelerating. You know, this whole concept of race, I think, is going to matter less and less, but it's a cultural construct. I think the, the way to 
to deal with this is to recognize that there are communities who are genuinely impacted. So, for example, high school dropouts uh, or communities along the border. So the way to deal with it isn't to restrict immigration, but to keep more people in high school, to keep more of the native born in high school and the communities along the border whose schools and budgets are being affected. There should be an expansion of the earned income tax credit and also a tax or a levy on the companies that benefit by immigration. Mm-hmm. So the tech companies, for example, there should be some sort of fee that they pay, which could be directed mm. towards those communities along the border who are definitely suffering. And that goes into their schools, into their hospitals. And it's something that the tech companies could actually be convinced to pay because they depend on immigration for their business. So there's intelligent ways to to do it, but we're not having an intelligent debate. It's all heat and very little light. I mean, there's no hope of any kind of immigration bill passing through Congress anytime soon. So we're just going to have a bitter, drawn-out fight in the courts and also in the sort of public sphere. So stories help. People don't respond to numbers. I've got lots of numbers in my book. I've got 50 pages of footnotes because I want my stories to be backed up. But ultimately, I wish every American could go to this place I went to on the Tijuana-San Diego border. It's called Friendship Park. So it's a little park where there's a fence. And this is the only place along the entire southern border where if you don't have papers and if you miss your family who's on the other side, you can go there on weekends and the border patrol will let you go there between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. on weekends to look at your family. You can't really hug them because there's a rusted iron fence between you and them. But there's this little holes in the fence where you can go up and your mother, who you haven't seen for 17 years, can come up to the other side of the fence and you look at her and you see her face and you you smell her, you feel her breath and you tell her how much you miss her. And then she puts her pinky through the hole in the fence because the hole is only big enough to put her pinky through. And you put your pinky through and you have what's, what they call the pinky kiss. And in that touching of pinkies, you communicate all the love and longing that you have for your mother. I spent two weeks in Friendship Park and it was the most heartbreaking place. And it's also an affirmation of family like I've never seen. You know, anyone who doubts that immigrants have family values, anyone who thinks of immigrants as criminals or rapists, should go down to Friendship Park and see all these families doing their pinky kiss. And it'll change hearts. I'm not calling for open borders in my book. I'm calling for open hearts. Siketa Mehta is the author of This Land is Our Land and Immigrants Manifesto. He also wrote a remarkably wonderful book called Maximum City, which is about uh, Mumbai, Bombay. It, it's so politically loaded. The, the Mumbai, it's like a weird, right? It's like a weird BJP thing, isn't it? Could it could be both. You know, I call it Bombay when I'm speaking English. I call it Mumbai when I'm speaking Gujarati and Hindi. I call it or Gujarati and Marathi, I call it Bombay when I'm speaking Hindi. Right. Uh, it's a city of many names and any of them is fine. It's a great book. You should check that out, Maximum City. Um, Suketu, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Bert. Once again, my great thanks to Suketu Mehta. Um, really remarkable guy. And like I said uh, at, at the top, you should absolutely check out This Land is Our Land and Immigrants Manifesto. You should definitely check out Maximum City, which is like a fa- just a phenomenal nonfiction book. And I eagerly await uh, his book on New York City. As always, we'd love to hear your feedback. We got great feedback after the last show. Did you hear, by the way? Did you hear that part? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got we got great feedback after the last show when I sort of gently discouraged you from emailing us uh, to relieve the burden from Tiffany Champion. And it said, tweet us. And you did. Tweet us at the hashtag with God. Last week, we solicited ideas for topics for podcasts about things that are happening in the world. We got a lot of great feedback on that. This week, I'd love to hear from the listeners what your own migration story is, whether that's a story uh, of your family, maybe that's a story of migrating from one place to another in the United States. Internal migration is migration as well. In fact, you know, it has different legal structures, but people move places for jobs. They go to new parts of the country and they discover new things. So tweet us, hashtag with pod, and tell us about what your migration story is. I'd love to hear about that. Why Is This Happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In Team, and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here, by going to nbcnews.com slash why is this happening.